when I was a child, we used to play a game. Uh, it goes by many different names, but this game involved sitting around in a circle and identifying someone to start a sentence that would spread from person to person through whispers. Anyone know this game? Anyone familiar with this game? Uh, I nearly thought about playing it in the room this morning by way of illustration, but I won't put you through that. But the, the, the point of the game was to highlight how easy it is for a message to get distorted and lost over time. And so I might start by whispering into Ali's ear over there, my name is Owen and I like basketball. And then it would whisper on, my name is Owen, I like basketball. And over time, if we went through the whole room, I bet you would come out with something like, I'm a fish and I don't know what to do. Well, I don't know, I didn't come up with a nice punchline there, but that, that game illustrates how over time, through whispers, the core of a message can be distorted and can be lost. And I think that can happen in our own lives when it comes to this message of Easter. We can become either so familiar with it or we can receive people's distorted perceptions and ideas about what Easter is really all about. And my prayer for this morning is that we would return to the source. You see, the way to to figure out who is true in that game is to go back, isn't it, to the first person who started that sentence and to ask them, so what did you say? That's what we're doing. We're returning to this eyewitness account, John's Gospel, and of that first Easter time when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead, met with his disciples. And we actually meet in this story that was read to us, a man who had heard some whispers. This man, Thomas, he was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, but we are told that he was not there when Jesus first appeared to his followers. And so here is a man that is interpreting the significance of Jesus, the ongoing significance of Jesus in his life through the whispers that he's hearing from other people. And he's saying, I can't believe this. And maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you've heard some whispers and maybe you have some ideas about what Easter is all about. Maybe you've lost some of the wonder of this Resurrection Sunday. But my prayer is that like Thomas, we would come afresh to this message. And more than that, we would come afresh to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ as Thomas did. That's what I want to prepare our hearts for as I speak now over the next few moments. To prepare our hearts to encounter the Lord Jesus again. What is he all about? What is Easter really all about? And then how should we respond to him? This encounter that Thomas has, I think it tells us a few key things about what Easter is all about. The first thing that this encounter tells us is that Easter, the message of Easter, is for outsiders. It is for outsiders. It's not for the in crowd, but it is for outsiders. Not just for the in crowd, but for outsiders. See, many people might say... I'm not a Christian because I wasn't born in a so-called Christian nation. Or many people might disqualify themselves from the Easter story and from the good news of Jesus for other reasons. It's not in my background. It's not in my personality. I'm just not one of those kinds of people. Well, Thomas embodies for us that kind of approach towards Easter. We read in verse 24 that Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Jesus had risen from the dead on that Easter morning and he had appeared to his followers in human flesh. He had shown them, I really did die on the cross for sins, but now I really am alive from the grave. But where was Thomas? He was on the outside of this experience. I wonder if you've ever felt on the outside of other people experiencing Jesus. Have you ever felt like you are the one who's on the margins? Have you ever felt like you're the one who's looking in at what other people are experiencing? You see, not only was he on the outside physically, he wasn't in the room. 
but he was emotionally on the outside. He was a man who'd invested all of his hopes in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. The man who had come proclaiming the kingdom of God and good news for all people. But he was a man who had seen this man, Jesus of Nazareth, die on a cross and all of Thomas's hopes had been dashed. And so he was left emotionally feeling scarred, traumatised, devastated by the experience. And now to add insult to that injury, he was emotionally, must have been thinking... Why would Jesus have shown up when I wasn't there? Just put yourself in Thomas's shoes for a moment. Why would he have shown up when I wasn't there? It's a horrible feeling, isn't it? To feel like you're an outsider, to feel like you are the one missing out. FOMO, the fear of missing out. It's a real deal in our world and our generation. And maybe we feel like the Christian faith is just another thing for us to feel alienated from. Another thing to make us feel like an outsider. Another thing to make us feel like we don't measure up, we're not good enough, we are not on the inside of this thing. But Thomas's story changes. And I believe yours and mine can too. See, if you this morning feel like you're an outsider to the message of Easter, in many ways, that's actually how we all begin. We are on the outside of the kingdom of God. We have turned our backs on him. We have run away from him. We have lived life on our own terms. But the good news is God does not leave us on the outside. God did not leave Thomas on the outside. But it says these words that eight days later... Although the doors were locked, Jesus came. And I just want to say to you this morning, if you feel like you're on the outside, Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. Jesus left his throne in heaven. He left the perfection of the kingdom of God and he stepped down from heaven to earth into our darkness and he had you and me in mind. He came to you, to the ones who were on the outsider, to, uh, who were outsiders, to the ones who were missing out on life in God's kingdom as we were born to live it. Jesus came. And he comes time and time again to those who feel like you're on the outside. I want to say this morning, it doesn't matter how your story started. It doesn't matter what people have done to you. It doesn't matter what you have believed or what people have spoken over you. It doesn't matter where you were born, where you're from. It doesn't matter how you were brought up. It doesn't matter how you enter into this room today. Whoever you are and wherever you've come from, the good news is Jesus came for you. He came for you. He came for you. So that you who were on the outside could come into all the love and the mercy and the grace and the healing and the forgiveness that God Almighty has for you. Jesus' whole life, from beginning to end, screamed out God's desire to welcome in those who are far from him. His whole life, his whole life embodied this broad welcome to all who are on the outside. Come on in, Jesus says. I came for you just like Jesus stepped into this room for Thomas. Could it be that Jesus is coming to you right now? And through my words, he is making his appeal to you. Come on in to all that I have for you. Which leads me to the second thing that we see in this story. Not only is the Easter message just for the in crowd, no, it's for, it's for outsiders too. But not only that, the Easter message is not just for the naive. <laughs> I want to say the Easter message is for outsiders and it is for skeptics. If you're one of those people, and I think we all can be in different areas of our life, who naturally approaches fantastical, amazing news with a... Hmm. Yeah, does that, that maybe characterise you? 
Just a nice kind of reserved, fold your arms, I'll wait and see about... Some of you are actually sat like this right now. <laughs> um, but we see, where does Jesus come to meet Thomas? Where does he come to meet him? In the midst of his questions and scepticism. Jesus doesn't wait for Thomas to put aside his scepticism and to become a bit more naive. Jesus doesn't wait for Thomas's guard to be down. No, Thomas is entering that room. And what do we read that he says? Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. He's got quite a list here. I will not believe. Some translations say I will never believe. Thomas was a skeptic. Jesus loves skeptics. Jesus' heart is full of love, compassion, and welcome to those with questions. And Jesus wants to meet us, not just at the end of our questions, but in the midst of our questions. Sometimes we think, I've got to get all the answers to my questions before I can have an encounter with Jesus, before I can put my trust in him, before I can live in relationship with him. That's got it all wrong, friends. That might be how other religions work. That might be how other people in your life work. In, in relationships of trust, you withhold yourself until you know. But Jesus wants to come in his tender, loving care and mercy and grace to you in the midst of your questions. He wants a relationship with you in the midst of your questions. And he wants to speak into that scepticism. So many people in our world put up barriers to the message of Easter because they want more evidence. And the reality is that for those who will take an honest look at the story of Easter, an honest look at the claims of the resurrection of this man, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for sin on Good Friday and claimed to rise again from the dead, for those who will take an honest look at the evidence. There is much evidence there to be found for our scepticism. I was speaking at an event a few years ago, and there was a lecturer from, he's a brother of someone in this room, Maths, Ruth, he's an Emmy a Maths lecturer. <laughs> Physics, sorry, Physics lecturer. I was speaking alongside there at that event. And a uh, physics lecturer from within Cardiff University said this, it is becoming increasingly hard in the scientific world to be both an atheist and a scientist. Becoming increasingly hard in the scientific world to stand on this claim, there is no God, and still be an honest scientist. And the, the reality is that the evidences of God are everywhere in our world, from creation around us to our souls within us, so that those who approach with scepticism, we can find evidence. But even in the Easter story and the historical account of the resurrection of Jesus, we find piled up this evidence that points towards this man really did conquer and beat death. These eyewitness accounts that we've got to read from the historical evidence that the tomb really was empty the disciples giving their life historically for this message of this man jesus being alive the proof of the lives of christians ever since who have claimed to know and experience the power of jesus in their own life for the skeptics there is evidence and all belief systems, whatever it is that we might believe this morning, all belief systems are based on faith. All based upon putting our trust in something beyond us being true. The invitation of Jesus to skeptics like Thomas is come and see the evidence. See, Jesus, once again, he meets with Thomas in the midst of his questions, in the midst of his skepticism. And what does Jesus end up doing? Showing Thomas exactly what he was looking for, inviting Thomas to come and test the evidence for himself. And if you're here this morning 
and you've put a barrier up between you and God because you feel like you want more evidence, I just want to encourage you to, with an honest heart, explore and look into these things for yourself. The claims of Jesus are too good to simply ignore and file away. They demand of us that we wrestle with, could this be true? Because if, if this is God, my creator, stepping into this world to offer me true life, then I would be a fool to walk away based on my scepticism alone. Especially when there's this promise that he will meet mm. with skeptics like you and me. The Easter message is for outsiders. The Easter message Thomas shows us is for skeptics. And finally, the Easter message is for souls it's for souls you see if we just stopped at this kind of mental cognitive mind intellectual belief in a set of facts we would be missing what is going on here for thomas that first easter time the, the easter message is more than a message it is an encounter and a relationship with a living person that is what Jesus came to bring Thomas that first Easter time. That is what Jesus wants to bring to our lives today. You see, you might look at a chair. If I pull the chair in front of us this morning, and you could look at this chair as a skeptic and say, right, I want some evidence that this thing is going to hold my weight. And so you might ask some people who have sat on the chair before, what's it like to sit on the chair? And you might do some scientific research into the way the chair was built and look at the different joinings and maybe even poke it in and test it a little bit. But there's a moment that comes, isn't there, where if you're going to make the most of what the chair is offering to your life, you've got to put your weight on it. And that is what the Easter message is. It's an invitation, not only for us to look at Jesus from a distance, and say, did he really exist? Did he really come? Did he really die for sins? Did he really rise from the dead? But to go from that to participating in a life with Jesus, welcoming him into your heart and starting that relationship with him. Jesus comes for souls to tell us the Christian message is not just a set of beliefs, it is an encounter with a living person. And what did this encounter entail? This is what it says. A week later, the disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus meets us in the midst of our searching when the doors are locked. Don't you love that? When we try and block Jesus out, maybe you've spent your life doing that. If you're really honest with yourself, you can see times I've tried to keep Jesus at arm's length. But Jesus will not be stopped from loving you. He will not be stopped from meeting with you. When you lock the doors, he wants to step in and he's doing that this morning. And then what does Jesus say? He says, peace be with you. He knows our deepest needs as human beings. Our deepest needs as human beings is that we would have peace with God, our creator. That we would cease from striving and being at enmity and living in rebellion with him. And so Jesus comes and he speaks, peace. Let's be friends, Jesus says. And that peace then overflows into a peace that can ground our whole lives in an assurance that we are known and loved by God. That's what he does for those who follow him however falteringly he speaks peace into your life every morning we wake up the risen jesus is waiting to speak peace into your life he comes for our soul's deepest need in the midst of our guilt of our sins and rebellion against god in the midst of our fear from living life on our own jesus says peace to you on both fronts into your guilt and to your fears and then Jesus says, Thomas, 
Put your finger here. Thomas, have a look. Thomas, reach into my side. <coughs> Don't miss something here. Jesus wasn't in the room when Thomas said, that's what I want him to do. <laughs> do you get that? Jesus knows Thomas. He knows him at such a deep level that words spoken by Thomas when he thought Jesus wasn't alive, let alone listening. Jesus speaks into Thomas's deep needs. He knows us deeply. Jesus Christ knows you. He knows you. He knows every part of your life. He knows every part of your story. He knows every word that's been spoken over you that's wounded you. He knows every hair upon your head. He knows every emotion that's filling your heart and every skepticism that's filling your mind. He knows you. He is not a distant God. He's near to you. He speaks peace to you. And he comes to Thomas as I believe he'd come to us with his wounds. Jesus wants to encounter people who are on the outside, skeptics, not in a overpowering show of resurrection glory. He can do that and he does do that. But he comes to Thomas and what does he show? The wounds of Calvary. What is it we really need in life, friends? What is it when we're wandering in this world, when we're filled with doubts, when we are looking for answers? What do we really need? I believe this story reminds us that what we really need is a God who is powerful enough to beat death and a God who is loving enough to be wounded for us. That's what stands before Thomas and before us today. He shows Thomas the wounds of Calvary, speaking into our fears and our guilt. A God who would love us so much that he would take on this kind of suffering on our behalf. And you know, I'm even aware this morning the sorrows that can accompany us on Easter morning as we were praying before the service. We just, almost each of us in the circle shared, so what's wrong in your life this morning? It wasn't like planned like that, but um, what stress, what strain, what difficulty, what heartache. Just, you know, just little things and bigger things. And just that reminder, Easter arrives in the midst of our pains. And it tells us of a God who suffers with us and suffers for us. A God who knows our sorrows and who loves us deeply and wants to love us towards healing. That is what Easter tells us. That is what Jesus encountered Thomas with today. And if you will open the door of your heart to Jesus this morning, he will speak into those deepest parts of your soul. And he will show you his wounds. And he will say... This is how much I love you, Thomas. The Easter message is not just a set of beliefs. It is a living encounter for our souls. And so as I close, what should we do with all this? How should we respond? What are you going to do this morning to the, with the news that there is a God who wants to bring you from being on the outside, bring you into his kingdom, bring you into his arms. What are you going to do with the news that there is a God who wants to meet you in the 